Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where, as with the Central Intelligence Agency, we try to learn, or at least uh, I, I do anyway, I can't speak for them, but the intelligence comes from my guests. And in this case, it's someone who was a journalist for 30 years, uh, International Herald Tribune and other publications, Patrick Lawrence. He was born Patrick Lawrence Smith. I mentioned that only because he wrote two very important books that I know about, but I didn't know he wrote them because they're under the label Patrick Smith, if you should want to go check them out. One was written in 2010 called Somebody Else's Century, uh, East and West in a Post-West World. And then I think it was two years later, he wrote a book about America having to adjust to a world in which the East uh, is now going to be the dominant force. And I think this is the important takeaway from the whole Ukraine-Russian invasion story that is the focus of so much news now. Because on the eve of this, and uh, Patrick has written for a number of journals, including uh, Consortium News and others. Um, I post them on my own website, Share Post. Uh, but one of the points he's made in his columns, and here's a guy who for 30 years covered uh, much of the world and uh, has, knows a lot about India, China, Japan, the three subjects of his East Takes Over book. But uh, he reminds us in his columns that Russia made a deal with China and India about uh, a multipolar world before uh, their most recent uh, the invasion of Ukraine. And that really the big change here, I'll let you take it over now, but the big shift really might be that this is no longer a Cold War I between Russia and the US, uh, basically white man's game, but now we're in uh, the other. And we're, we're in a multipolar world, whether we like it or not. And China and, and India alone, which represent well over 2 billion uh, people, uh, or close to pushing 3 billion at some point, uh, that much of the world is not even honoring the sanctions that have been posed by the European Union. So why don't you just give us your overview and, you know, from your 30 years uh, out there covering this world? Well, Bob, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you after so many years following your stuff. Um, uh, you know, I'm glad you mentioned, very generously mentioned uh, those two books. The second of them is called Time No Longer, and Yale brought it out. I note that one because in it, I, I made the argument that uh, America had a, a, a very considerable choice in front of it, and that was how to manage its own underscore relative decline um, against the emergence of, of other powers, uh, notably China, the Russian Federation, India, and so on, right? Uh, the, non the rise of the non-West. Uh, um, I consider that, I consider parity between the West and non-West an, an absolutely unstoppable imperative of the 21st century, uh, whether we like it or approve of it or not. Um, and my thought in that book was, we can do this gracefully. We can do it with imagination, uh, a certain courage, uh, um, wisdom, cleverness, uh, greeting a new global landscape uh, with, uh, with anticipation, enthusiasm indeed, or we can do it jealously, messily, uh, defensively uh, and um, the world will be in for uh, another unfortunately long interim of uh, disorder. Uh, 
And in that book, I said, you know, I think we have 25 years starting from the uh, September 11th uh, tragedies in 2001 um, just sticking my neck out a little. I said, I think we have about 25 years to make this decision. Uh, and we're now 21 years into that period and we have emphatically made that decision. Uh, we are not gonna do this gracefully. Um, we are going to do it with the utmost r resistance um, and uh, our foreign policies are are not going to have anything to do with uh, constructive sentiments or intent. Um, a, a dear friend, uh, no longer with us, used to say, we, we've made, our foreign policy is based on being the spoiler. We're going to be the spoiler. We're going to spoil things like a settlement in the Korean Peninsula, et cetera. Right? Now, now I think we're down to being the provocateur. We are going to provoke tension, potential conflict, danger uh, in those areas where we think we can, uh, we stand to, we, our leadership, right? Uh, in those areas where our leadership uh, judges, it can prolong American primacy a little bit longer. Uh, and, and that's what I think we're watching in Ukraine, and um, it's a two-front Cold War this time. So regrettable, even the phrase Cold War II. It's a two-front Cold War, and um, we're talking this morning about the Eastern Front, let's call it, with China. Um, Taiwan being the uh, center of gravity this time. The conceit of American culture, and that is the best way to describe it, I think, is that we own uh, this thing called freedom, self-determination, democracy. And once again, we always seem to be looking for the good war. When will World War II come back? We forget, of course, we entered, we resisted entering the good war until Russia had basically, the old Soviet Union had basically uh, broken Hitler's power. But leaving that aside, we've been looking. And Vietnam was going to be the good war we were against communist tyranny, that didn't work out. Iraq was going to be the good war. We were against terrorism, that didn't work out. And we now think in the Ukraine, you can almost get a, a, a giddiness about it. Uh, we got a good war. We're fighting on the side of these uh, Ukrainians for their freedom against, uh, we don't call it the Soviet Union, it's not a communist country anymore. Uh, but I think the real target is we'd like to take on China. And we'd like to take on China, not because it's a military threat, but because we don't can't stand the idea that these people who are still run by a communist party actually turned out to be more effective capitalists in the modern period than any other country. But that's probably not the way you look at it. I read your book, uh, reread it last night. By the way, I was at the LA Times Book Festival when they gave your uh, more recent book, uh, a you were a finalist. Uh, for the best nonfiction, as I recall. Uh, I didn't know it was you because, again, you had this name Smith of people want to look for it. How but, delightful but, you will remember that. Bob. But I was there. But uh, I should say shout out credit to my wife, Narda Zacchino, who used to be the associate editor. She founded the book festival. So I've gone to every one of them. But anyway, uh, you know, your, your thesis, it seems to me, is unmistakably clear. Uh, you, you, you know, Kipling <laughs> pointed it out. You've got to come to grips with the East. And you've written, you know, uh, uh, the book on China, on India and China and Japan is wonderful because it's complex. It understands that these are three very different countries. Asia is a very complex place. And what you are against is this idiotic thinking that we own the franchise for freedom, self-determination, mm. and so forth. And you've taken, in that book, three very different countries, Japan, India, and China, three countries that have been at war with each other quite viciously. And yet, you show complexity is the name of the game. And it's basically an argument for accepting a multipolar world. And what I found really ominous recently, aside from all of the putting arms and everything, great arms race 
over Ukraine, it would be like Vietnam. We'll, we'll, I think you said in one of your columns, we'll fight it until the last Ukrainian. But also there's this arrogance that, that Biden could go to Asia and say, we are now going to build a new wall against China. And we're going to, and then you wrote a column that they, he actually broke with American policy and said, we will militarily prevent you from, from reclaiming Taiwan. So we're at an incredibly dangerous moment. We're talking about not just Russia being nuclear armed. China, of course, is and has more of an ability to fight back. So why don't you kind of give us where we are? We're, we're at a very dangerous moment. And as far as I can see, the headline is really the U.S. is the provocateur. That's going to be hard for many liberal folks to accept. They think virtue is with Biden now. And uh, it reminded me of Martin Luther King. At one point, in, he lost the New York Times. They attacked him editorially a year before he died at Riverside Church when Martin Luther King said, I can't talk about nonviolence in the ghetto or in the world when my own government is the major purveyor of violence in the world today. And if we look at the arms industry and where we're shipping arms that's the U.S. government now, but you use the word provocateur. So uh, why don't why don't we deal with that? Okay, um, you know, uh, you, you you prompt me to remember a, an absolutely delightful tweet somebody sent out. Uh, I'm now censored from Twitter, uh, um, but while I was still able to read it. Some somebody uh, you mean sent, as a joke? You you don't mean you actually censored? Do you? Yeah, I'm. Uh, my account's been banished. Um, it has. Yeah, it was called. My name was the flautist. I had a nice number of followers, uh, but well, wait a minute. Um, they they just they banned you were like Donald Trump. You're banned. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness! His it really just disgraceful, right? Anyway. Um, well, Another. wait a minute. You're, you're not a new news person. You uh, work for the International Herald Tribune and other highly respected organizations for 30 years. You reported for war zones. You reported you, you, were, you weren't uh, in China during the Cultural Revolution, but you went there, I think, in 1980. You've been in India. You've interviewed a lot of these important leaders and so forth. And you're banned from Twitter? Yeah. These We're banned people, from Twitter, and we don't know that that's an assault on individual freedom. The people doing these censors, censoring this censoring, uh, they have no sense of history. They have no regard for experience. What modest wisdom one may have accumulated uh, along the way. Now, uh, the the question, the cutting edge question. They, I mean, they've been at this for a long time. It, they, they came after me and numerous others, uh, or some others anyway. Um, the Ukraine war is, uh, has proved the, the cutting edge question. Uh, they judged uh, the Democratic Party in, in concert with Silicon Valley. Everybody has to be, stay right on side uh, as we wage this proxy war. Um, YouTube has erased uh, something like 9,000 uh, videos uh, containing uh, questioning the orthodox version of the war and why it started and all that. So it's sort of full tilt, uh, full, full tilt uh, campaign now. And I, I, got, uh, I got hit, you know. Um, anyway. Well, let me just say, since I get almost no traffic <laughs> from uh, Twitter, uh, you're welcome to write for sheer posts. And maybe I should specialize in uh, publishing people who have been banned on Twitter. Maybe Refugees. That's the, that, well, that's yeah. the new literary badge of honor. Uh, yeah. And uh, we'll go on. <laughs> get, you, you, need, you need a motto, Bob, like give me your tired, your, your beleaguered, your censored. I mean, I'm making a joke of it, but it's pretty I frightening. I mean, you know, the fact that, you know, well, OK, it's not officially the government doing it. But my goodness, when you have a, a, a monopoly, a cartel 
Uh, yeah. What, what, do we feel better if, if, if Putin got a, a cartel in Russia to ban yeah. you? Rather than, that, you know, that's the only thing he's missing. Then we couldn't call it tyranny, right? The uh, government is not doing it de jour, but it is yeah. doing it de facto because it's pressuring Silicon Valley um, uh, to to act. It's this very quite well, legible. Uh, as long phenomenon. as we've defined you now, or Twitter has is this dangerous radical. I still would like to get your vision. Yeah, uh, let's go back of, to the question. Of where we are now in the right. world, because like it or not, uh, there are these billions of people who live in countries that are not honoring our sanctions and do not. I mean, India yeah. and China, two systems that, by the way, India used to be the great bastion of dem democracy in the hopes of the U.S., right, uh, for Asia. Mm -hmm. And then we had communist China that we wouldn't allow to be in the U.N. and wouldn't recognize. But now you've got these two countries that have actually had waged uh, you shot at each other. Uh, and yet we are uniting them and mm. we're uniting them with Russia, something communism wasn't able to do. Uh, there was Sino-Soviet dispute, the Chinese communists and the Russians communists uh, shooting at each other. That started even before the communist revolution. So, but now we uh, are managing to unite India, China, Russia, and, and, and uh, India and China are buying the oil that we're preventing Russia from selling in Europe. So the world yeah. has actually confirmed your prediction in, in your book, in your excellent book. Uh, I keep bringing it up because I only finished rereading it uh, about three hours ago. Uh, it's an easy read. It's 200 pages. And I do want to recommend that even more than your book about the United States. So if somebody wants more information, it's called Somebody Else's Century, East and West in a Post-Western World. So let's get to that point. All right. Let, I go back to that delightful tweet I was going to tell you about. It, it was during those weeks when uh, Secretary Blinken and others in the administration were trying to recruit China to join the sanctions against Russia and uh, at the very least not aid Russia as it uh, seeks to uh, transcend them one way or the other. Uh, and somebody sent out this tweet saying, uh, dear China, please help us uh, subvert Russia so then we can concentrate on you. <laughs> Time for a break. Uh, and we'll be back in KCRW sponsors include Toyota. L.A. Pride is back. And this year's theme is hashtag love your pride. The Toyota Mirai is teaming up with L.A. Pride again in 2022 to bring an unforgettable experience to the L.A. Pride in the park. L.A. Pride in the Park runs 1 p.m. to 11 p.m. Saturday, June 11th at Los Angeles State Historic Park. To learn more, visit LAPride.org. How can you support KCRW? Lots of ways. Subscribe monthly, just like you do to streamers, publishers, and that box for your dog. And donate your car. Vehicles don't last forever. When it's time to retire your car, truck, boat, motorcycle, RV, or riding mower, hit us up. We'll take it off your hands and turn it into great radio. Just go to kcrw.com slash cars. Two minutes. We're back with Sheer Intelligence and our guest. If you look at the project for New American Century, the neocons who are now seem to have occupied the Biden State Department quite effectively, uh, China was really their target. We yes. never accepted the idea that we would have a world of peace or a multipolar world. They were after China. And the fact that Chinese are very good capitalists made them even more of a threat. Yeah. Now, look, uh, Russia, post-Soviet Union, Russia, um, it has its work to do by way of development, uh, urban rural divides, so on. Uh, manufacturing sector is not what one would want it to be. Uh, but China is another sort of story, and I uh, and I think uh, you know they're they're plainly it, it, extremely gifted by way of technological innovation uh, and, and applications and so forth, right? Uh, um, common East Asian story, and I, I think in and the the very size of the place. Uh, it's very plain that China, already a regional power, is rapidly emerging as a global power. Um, 
And I think in Washington, some while ago, I think uh, they uh, identified China as the main quotation marks threat or the main country we are going to insist is a threat, right? I put it that way because China is in no way a threat of this kind. Uh, we consistently misread its intentions. It's very unfortunate, right? Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the main issue in Washington policy cliques is not the Russian Federation, it's China. Um, that's our long-term, again, our perceived long-term threat. Uh, and I, I urge your listeners at this point to, to watch very carefully because we are, <laughs> we are reliving a moment uh, that last came to us uh, 70 odd years ago, all right? Uh, and I'm talking about the origins of the Cold War. This is very blurred in history in most of the books. Uh, but I think if you study what happened carefully and with a proper degree of disinterest and discernment, you will understand that the standard story that the Soviet Union started the Cold War is just wrong, right? Uh, we provoked the Cold War. I'm happy to say that on your program. Um, uh, so there's the question of causality, responsibility, uh, agency, uh, chronology. Those, those are important words uh, in our context today. Uh, and we need, to, uh, I, urge, I urge all of us uh, to, to sort of bear witness here and recognize with history in mind, the, the history I just mentioned in mind, these questions of causality, responsibility, and the chronology of events. We are provoking this, this uh, friction with China um, for our own purposes. And, you know, uh, the standard American understanding of China now has been bent way, way out of shape. Uh, China's intentions are nothing like what uh, our policy people and media assign to them. Uh, they are not looking for an open conflict. They are not looking uh, to push America back to the coast of California. They simply want to. Um, uh, they simply want to play a, a role in their region uh, that is commensurate with their emergence as a power. Right. You know, um, let me let me stop you with that sentence because okay. I know what you just said, and also I read, and and I'm not. You know, I, I generally have people on this show who I I want people to read their books or watch their documentary. I'll be honest about that. But you really wrote a very, very important book. And I'm not putting down your more recent book, but that someone, somebody else's century, East and West in a post-Western world. That includes India's century, Japan's century, you know, and, and you go through, the, couldn't throw Brazil's century, a lot of other countries out there. And uh, what I loved about your book is I know something about China. I was a fellow in the Center for Chinese Studies uh, back in 1963. I actually was in China during the Cultural Revolution, one of the few observers uh, there. Uh, and I saw China swing all the way over to anarchy and irrationality and, and really quite a bit of violence. I, I, and what I loved about your writing in that book and it applies to India, Japan, and anywhere else you might write, you have a kind of Graham Greene wisdom uh, of, of, of uh, recognizing that life is not the way we'd like to order it. It has its own rhythms. 
and and uh, it was you know he he's sort of the poet for my money of anti-imperialism in spirit graham green he he was about mexico he was about vietnam uh his yeah. books and so forth and your book has that texture you don't give china or india or japan a pass you talk about their struggles with tradition identity uh, you know, uh, uh, how complex it is, how there are no easy answers. So you just made a couple of statements on this program that might suggest to listeners that you have a simplistic view, but that would be wrong. You actually have a very complex view of China, India, Japan, and the rest of the world. And you earned this complex view by 30, 40 years of being a reporter out there. I have to remind people, this is not some armchair intellectual, you know, spouting. You paid your dues. You were out there schlepping around, uh, interviewing people, uh, you know, you were in war zones and so forth. So why don't you tell us about what you learned in the field and why you've come to this conclusion? Well, thanks, Bob. Uh, you're very generous about that book. And I I have to be uh, grateful for that. Uh, I'm reaching a copy across the way here. Uh, because in all honesty, I continue to think it's the best thing I ever wrote. But I, I've never really been willing to rely on that judgment because, entirely because I was, it, it, I was the happiest I've ever been when I wrote it. And maybe that colors my judgment. Look, I, I have made a commitment to listeners of this show that I will not discuss a book without reading it from beginning to end, even if that means staying up the night before I do the interview, which happened last night, you know, and I, in this case, it was a reread. Uh, but I, I, I think people have to take uh, ideas seriously. They have to take books seriously. They can't just skim them. They can't just look for the, you know, the bloodlines or what have you. And, and what you're writing, your journalism is really all about is nothing more dangerous or radical in terms of being banned uh, from, from your Twitter account, uh, nothing more dangerous than acknowledgement of complexity, complexity. Yeah. And people always go to war first by denying complexity. So there's yeah, no I hope of negotiation. More. There's no hope of compromise. And that's hmm. where we are now. Even Biden had to walk it back and say, oh, no, no, we're not for regime change in Russia. After his secretary of defense has said we want to destroy <laughs> their ability to protect themselves. You know, uh, yeah, lots of luck with that. They happen to have these nuclear weapons, which we gifted the world with. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so but I'm trying to get a little energy into this because I feel um you're being a little too blasé about it. We're talking about the possible end of all human life. That's what these nuclear weapons represent. And, and it's not just Russia, it's Pakistan, it's India, it's China, it's Israel. There are a lot of weapons out there. And it doesn't take more than, a, you know what, a couple of dozen of them to destroy most of what we think is life on this planet. Mm. Mm. And, and they're there and they have the delivery systems. And we want to put a guy like Putin up. First, we say he's crazy or psychological or has a death wish or whatever. And then we want to put his back up against the wall. And, and we've talked about all of his generals and advisors as being war criminals. And, and then we expect them to be rational and meet us at the negotiating table. It don't work that way. You know, uh, you know, Bob, if you, if you think about this uh, historically, uh, uh, the the America, the stated American intent in 1945 was to bring along the world uh, into a, a grand era of prosperity, material well-being, uh, uh, raise up the, the underdeveloped uh, nations, the impoverished and all that. You, you, I, I don't need to go on, right? Uh, and if you think about what's going on now in with that little thought of this historical thought, you have to say, wait a minute, uh, the rise of China, um, which uh, has brought hundreds and hundreds of millions of people out of poverty just in the last few decades, uh, 
the rise of China, the rise of India, Pakistan, Brazil, the South Africans, and so on and so on, right? Uh, aren't we supposed to be applauding this as exactly what we wanted to see and what we set out to engender uh, seven decades and some ago, right? Think about that, right? The reality is we can't handle it. We, we just can't imagine uh, a, a world that rests on anything even remotely a, pr resembling the parity, right? Uh, so one of the th one of the things you just mentioned it quite struck me is uh, Putin is Putin must be insane. I, I love some of this stuff. It's so it's so bitterly amusing, right? Putin must be insane. His generals aren't telling him what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on, right? Uh, the Russian people don't like him. They're against the war, right? Parentheses, he's got an 80% plus approval rate at this point, right? Uh, we, we, and, and she, she, she is power mad, right? Uh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a tyrant, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, we cannot allow these leaders any, any attribute of rational thinking, right? We, we cannot permit, we, we cannot our, uh, uh, let our minds uh, in on the idea that these people are acting in a rational way in, this, in the interests of their countries, right? Uh, that's what I think that we're, we're watching and reading about every day with the, with these caricatures of of Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and, and other such leaders. I'll make a qualification here. I do not approve of Mahendra Modi and what he is doing to India. This um, this Hindu nationalist stuff. Uh, I wrote about it in the book. Where mentioning uh, called Hindu. But your approval is not the critical thing. No, it doesn't critical, mean anything. The critical I, you know. understanding I got of India, and I, I share your uh, biases. <laughs> I, I, I favor secular democracy. I'm a, a narrow man. <laughs> I thought India would lead us to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and I believed in all the non-alignment and so forth. But the fact is what's threatening about India now, China now, and ultimately any country in the world uh, is not their failure to their own people. We love them when they're totalitarian and oppressive. In mm -hmm. fact, our big issue with China is that we'd like them to keep the wage rates down. <laughs> you know, Apple doesn't want unions in the United States. They certainly don't want real unions in yeah. China. So we like Chinese totalitarianism when it gives us phony unions, when workers yeah. can't organize. That's yeah. not the issue. The issue is whether it's India or China or any other place in the world, if they decide that they get to also make world history, that they get to decorate the, the world and the uh, uh, you know, and find places where work for them and things that work for them and, and including grand concepts of freedom and so forth and bring their own sensitivity about religion or after all, mm. we claim the right to define democracy, but we were the biggest slave owners. OK, yeah. uh, and we didn't yeah. let women even vote until 1920, for God's sake. We're talking about women's rights in the world uh, and, and, and we didn't have them in our yeah. great flowering of democracy, uh, let alone racial equality. And we endorse you know, Bob, it, and my goodness. So there's an arrogance to this. And that I'm not here to defend the Indian government now. What I am here is to defend plurality and, and, and the easy condemnation of any choices any of these governments make. Yeah. You, you, uh, you caught me out a little there, Bob. Uh, I, I, I do not approve of uh, Hindutva. I think it's a, it's a terrible blight on uh, one of the most wonderful countries in the world um, uh, for all its diversity and so forth. But you, you make a very sound point. I, I fell into a trap uh, I often uh, urge others to avoid. 
it doesn't really matter what I think of Modi. That's the business of the Indian electorate. Uh, uh, it, and it's more importantly, this, this must apply to the, 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 the discourse concerning Russia and China, right? Uh, I don't quite know what I think of, of Vladimir Putin on, on the domestic side, right? But that's none of my business. Um, uh, that's the business of the Russian people. Ditto China. Uh, this goes back to you. I love your reference to Nehru. I, I'm right with you on those, on that generation of larger than life uh, leaders after the war. Nehru, my, my four ends: Nehru, Nasser, Nereri, and Nkrumah. Right. Um, and, and then all the others are Benz and uh, uh, Mossadegh and Lumumba, et cetera. They're, what a, what a, what a visionary generation, right? Um, uh, and Joe on lies five principles, right? If you listen to what the Chinese are saying now, they're actually quoting those principles. The, the internal affairs of other countries are 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 not to be uh, intervened upon, and and I, I mention this point now. I'll finish up my remark. Uh, uh, when we are judging Russia and the war in Ukraine and so on and so forth, it is simply no good referencing whatever goes on in Russia by way of the press or uh, civil rights or NGOs or any of that, it is simply not pertinent, right? Uh, parentheses, the late Stephen Cohen used to remind me, the press in Russia is far more diverse in its opinions than ours, right? Uh, or it was until this war, you know, that's the whole problem with war, whether it's the United States or Russia or anywhere else, as Orwell pointed out, whether it's an invented war or a real war, you're going to lose freedom. And that's true of imperialism as well. Uh, you cannot, this was the whole warning of our founders. You cannot be, they contradicted it right away by being an imperialist in regard to Native Americans and hmm. you know, people of color and so forth. Uh, but the fact of the matter is you can't be an imperial power and be enlightened and democratic. It's not. War makes it idiots of us all. War hmm. makes barbarians of us all. That's the lesson of human history. You know? Now, look, uh, uh, back in 1898 uh, with the Spanish-American War, that was the moment when America de declared itself uh, an empire. Okay. Um, and you had people like Twain, the Anti-Imperialist League and all that, right? Uh, the, truth, the truth of that time uh, was, was very, very stark. And, and, it, and it, it, it is no less pertinent today. You can either have an empire abroad or you can have democracy at home, but you cannot have both. That's it. Uh, and and um, we, are, we are living the truth of that. Look at us domestically. It's a very sad story, isn't it? I don't, I don't wish to be, I don't wish to be any grimmer than uh, the reality around us. Uh, but that's the truth of it. Right? It's also uh, the lesson of the Western experience. You go back to Aristotle, when Aristotle advised Alexander to be a ruthless emperor to the rest of the world, treat him as as brutes and beasts and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And, and yet be kind to all the Greeks. That was the prescription. And that's the problem we're having with China now. We refuse to accept that the one point, when I was in the Center for Chinese Studies, there were between four and 500 million Chinese, probably closer to 500 million. This was 1963. The conventional wisdom in our circles the experts was that China could never develop, had no petroleum, the land was exhausted, and overpopulation would doom them. China has stood this on its head, okay? Yeah. And, and yeah. they now have almost a billion more people, uh, and, and they've done incredibly well by those people. So the real issue is 
are those people brutes, vegetables, as Aristotle would have talked about them, beasts, uh, or are they deserving of the same rights as Athenians? And, yeah. and, and that, or people living in New York or California or Alabama or Texas. And that is the real issue. And whether it's coming out of Trump or out of Biden, we basically have a view of, of the people living in China, India, and elsewhere as an undifferentiated mass not really worthy of respect for their intellect, their experience. And as you point out in your book, by the way, I have found from our thousands of Chinese students we have here uh, at USC where I teach, they actually have a better and clearer and smarter understanding of the United States than the average American student has of China. Oh, without any doubt, Americans don't need to understand other people. Other people need to understand us. That's we'll because of the power that. balance. Right? Tell us that. about that. That's the real message of your book. I am so irritated. I, I mean, I'm so upset that a man of your knowledge could be banned from Twitter. I well, just don't get it. Why does not that enrage? Where are our press organizations? Where is Penn? You know, are you a member of Penn? Is it supposed to protect? Are you writers? kidding me? Uh, not on your life, given well, what Penn's well, made of it. Well, I mean, so. I was honored by Penn one year. You know, uh, uh, so was Chris Hedges. Yeah. What's going on? Where are Penn's... the human rights organizations? Where are are the? You're, you're a, a press person, a long distinguished establishment career, and and you can be banned. From, from Twitter, and we talk about freedom? Yeah. Listen, uh, Penn's gone the way of the ACLU and all these other institutions. It's just not what it was. For, you, know. Uh, you know, LBJ once uh, said in his colorful way, uh, uh, since your program is fun for the whole family, I'll put it politely, uh, uh, you're either outside the tent urinating in or inside the tent urinating out, right? Uh, and in my judgment, uh, People in, in our profession have been given a choice. I, I think this choice was uh, coming at us for many, many, many years, but I think it's become, uh, since 2001, I don't think there's any place to hide anymore. Uh, you've got to be either inside the tent, putting out the orthodoxy, or you've got to be outside the tent, uh, uh, you know, taking care of the, the ethics and standards that used to govern our profession and okay. no longer do. I've right? been very flattering up to this point, but bite your tongue. <laughs> because that's not even good career advice to a young journalist now. Yeah, because the fact true. is the center will not hold. It is yeah. in disarray. We didn't create Donald Trump with our honest reporting. A failed system created Donald Trump. The yeah. failure of liberal democracy created Donald Trump. The failure to solve problems of immigration, of income inequality, of racism, of gender inequality. That's what created a boob like, like Donald Trump. And then they, they want to blame uh, critical reporters on, on the left side of things. That's garbage. Yeah. And, and so your, your advice is wrong because the tent will not stand up. And the fact <laughs> is we're, we're in disarray now. You know, it's a good point. Uh, yeah, it's a good so point. Go pitch good your own take. tent. Go yeah. pitch your own tent. Invent your own journalism. I don't know. We could end it on that, but we have not. I want to go a little longer because people still will not understand that you have done your homework. That's what I wanted this come out of this. That's why I chased you down to do this podcast. Well, let you, me return spent, to it. Yeah, go give us the homework. Let, let you me had, return to You've a, talked a to these leaders. You were there. Tell us what you learn on yeah. the streets. Uh, I want to return to a point we slightly lost a minute ago. Uh, and that is the, the nature of these uh, non-Western societies we're talking about. Okay. Uh, you're quite right about America. We, we, we have the monopoly on democracy and liberties and so on and so forth. Yes, that's our credo, our, our creed. But it causes us to, it prevents us from seeing other people clearly. And uh, uh, as I said in a, I think the column that brought us together, uh, if there's one thing uh, people in the, the 21st century demands of 
our diplomats and statesmen, stateswomen, and the rest of us too. Journalists, certainly. It is learning to see uh, and understand the perspectives of others, how the world looks from their point of view. We just have no gift for this, uh, we Americans, We're primarily because there's geography and so on, but primarily because we haven't had to. Now, let me go to another point here. Uh, a, a wonderful Bengali scholar uh, named Partha Chatterjee, uh, he teaches in Calcutta uh, some of the year, at, at least last I followed him, uh, spent a semester a year at Columbia, um, published a book in the 90s, a uh, book of essays called um, the politics of the governed. And he made a very provocative point. Uh, I certainly saw this as I walked around uh, India, China, uh, to an extent it applies to Japan indeed. And it's this, legitimacy in our time does not necessarily any longer derive from participatory democratic uh, processes and institutions. It derives from uh, the, the provision of various services and social values, security, uh, safety, uh, education, clean water, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, it's a, uh, you know, uh, when I first read that, I bought, it was first published in Delhi by a very small press. Um, and I, that's, when, that's where I read it. I said, you know, I have, I have a somewhat Western sensibility. This idea, I find it quite disturbing, right? Uh, um, what's going to happen to our, uh, our democratic, our, our notions of democracy? Right. Uh, but I, I looked around and I said, do, do, do I have a right to uh, do I have a right to hold the Indian population to that standard? Look at this country. Uh, look at the deprivation right? Uh, and the underdevelopment. They're coming along nicely, but look at how, what a long way they have to go. The same applies in China. Uh, so what are we talking about here? Uh, we are talking about uh, different sort of civilizational uh, standards, um, different idea of what a just society looks like and how it functions. Um, uh, and and I, I think that's one of the, the main things I came back from my 29 years in Asia, uh, that's one of the main truths I had in my suitcase when I arrived back in the States. Um, we, have, we need to see societies as they understand themselves. We, it, it is not necessary for us to approve. It's not, I don't think they would even care if we did or not. Um, but it is necessary for us to understand them on their own terms. Let, let me just throw one thing in here, though. Um, we, we don't want, we're not innocent about this. I, I just, as I was thinking, my, my, one of my first trips to Asia was when I got Paul Krasner, who was editing the Realist magazine, and he made a a lot of uh, money off posters that said, uh, well, I guess we are NPR, so uh, F communism. And they <laughs> sold like hotcakes. There were red, white, and blue banners. And you put them up in your dorm and your dorm advisor couldn't say, take that down because you could accuse them of being a communist. So it was absolutely brilliant, yeah. the F-U-C-K communism posters. And he had some money, so he bought me a ticket to Vietnam and uh, I, I, that's how I went there in 1964. And anyway, and I bribed my way into an area that where there was some combat with the Viet Cong and the Delta. 
And uh, then my driver abandoned me there as a journalist. You will appreciate <laughs> that happens. And suddenly it was nightfall and all the people who were talking to me faded away. And suddenly there was a firefight and, and I was alone. And believe it or not, I actually found refuge in one of these Graham Greene described something that it was left over from the French Indochina war. They were wooden towers that uh -huh. maintained security. So I climbed up into this one <laughs> that was there. And there were a couple of other guys, Vietnamese people taking refuge in there. They were annoyed as hell that I joined them, but they didn't kick me out. And I had a night of absolute fear uh, to contemplate. What the hell was I doing there? What was my government doing there? What do we really know about these mm. people? And in reading your book, what I found so powerful was your description of Western mischief. I mean, you go back to the Portuguese <laughs> adventurers, you go back to the Spanish, you go back uh, to the Opium War, you go back, the, the intrusion of, by the West on the East, we're not innocent bystanders. We help create the mess of China mm. and India, we Westerners with our wisdom. And, and we messed up their history terribly. You know, I was in Cambodia uh, when, when, uh, when uh, you know, uh, it was a pleasant, wonderful place, uh, wonderful king and, and so forth. And then what happened? Millions have killed and we extend the war and we all of the nightmare, the terrible things we've done. And, and in your book, one is introduced to this East, not as a place of innocence, you know, the Beatles going there to find virtue in India, but as a, a wasteland, as a, a plundered land, as a deliberately divided area. And a lot of what plays out now that we're getting from India, we get it from Japan, we get it from China, uh, is their reaction to grievances that in large measure have to do with Western behavior. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, and right now, think about the arrogance of, of Joe Biden, who, who, you know, when he is informed and alert, uh, has endorsed these American adventures, going there to lecture uh, the how to, to put a new what he wants to put a wall. Now, let me end on that, because your book denounces walls uh, in a very poetic way. And what we are about now is building walls. We want a wall against Russia. We want a wall against China. And, we, and you remind us in your book, it was Ronald Reagan who said, tear down that wall. It was Gorbachev who responded. And we now want to build walls. That's what Absolutely. NATO is about. So let's end on that. Tell us where you think yeah. we're headed. Mr. Biden, don't build that wall, right? Uh, he's building it as quickly as we can. Look, uh, my take on this is uh, the, the rest of the world, the, the, the West is becoming progressively more isolated. He who would isolate is, uh, is becoming more isolated. The countries that have signed on for these sanctions number, I think, 25. Um, the countries that have declined to sign on to them number 160. What the rest of the world is telling us, uh, if I may, the non-West, the global South, what, what have you, uh, is that they don't want they don't want a world where these walls exist. They paid rather dearly. Uh, uh, we tend to miss this. The non-Western world paid very dearly for for uh, for Cold War One uh, in terms of stunted development. The the aspirations expressed by that wonderful group of leaders we were mentioning earlier, Nehru and so on, uh, were. Um, were nearly extinguished. Uh, 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 societies did not rise the way they aspired to. They paid. They paid materially, uh, in spirit, etc. And they don't. And what happened after the wall came down was these very same aspirations arose once again. We don't want to be aligned with America or the Soviet Union. We just want to be Nigerians or Tanzanians or Venezuelans or what have you, right? Uh, and that's, that's what the world wants once again. 
um, I mentioned earlier uh, America, America's assumption of a post-Cold War assumption of a role as spoiler and now provocateur. It's really very sad, not to say tragic, Bob, that this is exactly the world we are once again, just as we did in the late 40s, this is the world we are, our leaders are attempting to prevent from coming into being. I want to close with a pitch here. I think if you want to pick up one book to try to understand uh, the East, pick up Somebody Else's Century. Uh, it was written uh, 12 years ago, but it's very fresh right now. Uh, it's a very well written. Somebody Else's Century, East and West in a post Western world. And I think one way or another, we are going to be certainly uh, in a multipolar world in which just as a matter of energy and intellect and population, it's, it's going to be Eastern centered. So I, I want to say, check out Patrick Lawrence. The book titles are written, the author is Patrick Lawrence Smith. That's another story we'll visit in another uh, discussion. But I want to say, uh, it reeks of complexity in the best sense. It's thoughtful. It's great work. Just want to end on that note. I want to thank uh, Christopher Ho and Laura Kondorogian, uh, the producers of the show at KCRW for doing a great job. Joshua Shear, who is the executive producer, who puts it all together uh, uh, and holds it together. And I want to thank uh, the J, um, I always get this wrong, the JKW Foundation, which in the memory of Gene Stein, a terrific a journalist for providing us with some funding. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence.